My vision of, of a realistic energy plan is, is one that has balance. I come from a producing state. Alaska has been providing oil to the rest of the nation for the past 25, 30 years. We're producers in the fossilized fuel area. But that, that can't be the only underpinning of an energy policy for this nation. We must be producers. Uh, to, to make sure that, um, particularly with our fossilized fuels, we're, we're doing as much as we can domestically. But we must be realistic about the future of our energy needs in recognizing that the future is not necessarily fossilized fuels. It's the renewables, it's the alternatives, it's what can come to us from the wind, from solar, from geothermal, uh, from ocean energy. There's so much potential that is out there, and I think we recognize that. We've got to move to that next generation. So that's one piece of the three-legged stool when it comes to an energy policy, is the renewables, uh, the, the traditional forms of, of energy, the fossilized fuels, and increased uh, domestic production there. But the third piece must be conservation and efficiency. You cannot, you cannot talk about an energy policy without making sure that what we're doing in our consumption is responsible. And that's where the conservation piece comes in. That's where the efficiency piece must come in. So I'm working towards a policy that does provide us that balance, that realism um, that I think is, is healthy for the country. Let's talk about ANWR first. <clears throat> we are we're discussing an area of the north slope of Alaska, uh, a relatively small area that we would like to open for exploration and potential development. We believe that the potential is there for perhaps the largest uh, reservoir uh, to be discovered in North America. So it's, it's certainly worth looking at. The concern has been how you develop in an area on the coastal plain that is, is environmentally fragile. Well, my response is we have been producing on the North Slope just about 45, 50 miles to the, to the west of Anwar. We've been doing it um, for the past 30 years we've been in production coming out of Prudhoe Bay, the largest field, oil field, in, in North America. We've been providing a much needed resource to the rest of the nation, and we've been doing it in a manner that is responsible and in balance with the environment. Uh, people are concerned about the impact to, to the animals, to the caribou as they move through. What we've seen with the caribou herd in the, in the Prudhoe Bay fields is that that herd has increased in the past 25 or 30 years six-fold. Some estimates put that at six to eight-fold. The caribou, have their numbers have increased. So even though we have had development activity up on the slope, we've been able to do it in an environmentally responsible way. And think how far we've come in our technology in oil and gas development in the past 30 years. The technology that we used to develop Prudhoe was one thing. What we will be able to do if we're allowed to go into Anwar will be dramatically different in terms of reducing the footprint that we leave on the land. We're able to use directional drilling, putting, putting a, a, a well down, and being able to drill out in, in all directions up to eight miles around without, without anything showing on the surface, without any disturbance. The caribou won't know what's going on underneath, and yet we're still able to produce a resource that this country desperately needs. We've come a long way in our technology, in, in how we can explore and develop in the Arctic. We'd like to be able to demonstrate that in a very small portion of the of the 1002 coastal plain offshore is very much the same think about the advances that we have seen in technology that allow us for instance in the in the gulf of mexico to be drilling at the depths that we're drilling and providing for for oil and natural gas it's because of the technology that we have now up north where you're dealing with ice conditions 
there's a there's more of an unknown if you will but I am a firm believer that our technology can allow us to go in directions that we've never been able to do before and the potential is up there for us to 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 reach out and tap into that we recognize uh, that our potential up onshore in in Alaska is absolutely um, incredible in its scope in terms of our conventional sources of natural gas and in our unconventional in our in our methane uh, in our hydrates all we need to figure out is how we get that resource from from the the vast expanse up there to the markets in in America, in the lower 48. We're working on that as we speak. The potential there for natural gas is huge. One other thing that is, is worth mentioning, though, is a recent study just came back um, assessing the natural resources in the Arctic, in the, in the Arctic as a whole, not just off of Alaska. It is estimated that the oil reserves and the natural gas reserves in the, the areas offshore Alaska are as great there as they are in, in any other part of the Arctic. They're assessing that uh, approximately 20 to 25 percent of the world's remaining reserves of oil and natural gas are in the Arctic. That's at our fingertips, literally, um, if we can use our technology to help uh, advance that. Well, what some people in the rest of the country might not remember or acknowledge is that America is an Arctic nation, and we are an Arctic nation because of Alaska. We're your connection. And, and think about what this gives us as a nation. We've talked about the resource potential. It is enormous. And when we're talking about energy security and energy independence, we must look to the north. We've got those resources, they've been identified, let's figure out how we tap into them. Think about it from the, from the marine um, shipping aspect. For the first time, we're seeing shipping lanes that are free and clear of ice going up around Alaska and in through the Northwest Passage. In terms of what that means for commerce and how we can reduce costs and move goods um, and, and provide for, for defense, all of a sudden, the world is, is wide open. It's opened up a new part of the globe that, to this point in time, has really been impenetrable. But with that opportunity comes, comes other challenges. You have, say, increased shipping up north. We don't really have the infrastructure yet to provide for the, the safety and soundness, if you will, of, of the, the transportation and, and the commerce that we might anticipate. We don't have the harbors. The Coast Guard is currently looking at this and making an assessment in terms of security and how do we, how do we provide for a level of environmental protection. So we've got to make sure that we've got the necessary protocols in place, that we're, we're taking the steps necessary to provide for a level of security as we embrace these challenges that, and, and opportunities that present us um, as, as an Arctic nation. Unfortunately, the timeline is very long, and that's why we have been pressing aggressively. Let's do more. Let's be a participant in the Arctic. And in order to be a participant, what is that going to take in terms of the assets? We, we've only got two cutter, uh, two icebreakers as a nation. I mean, that, that doesn't make sense, in my opinion. Uh, so we've got to move forward with that. Um, but we also need to do it in a way that is, is recognizing, again, we are an Arctic nation. So how are we going to advance our potential? And it's not just with the icebreakers. Um, <clears throat> what are we doing, um, for instance, to, to enhance uh, the Coast Guard assets that we would want to be monitoring the, the, the coast up there? Uh, how do we prepare for um, uh, increased pressures on our fisheries, for instance, 
uh, increased uh, activity uh, as it relates to extraction of, of resources up north. Let's make sure that we are not only a participant, but an early participant, helping to set the stage for the rules up there so that we don't get run over, if you will, or, or kind of this notion that, well, um, nobody's really paying attention from the U.S. side, so the Canadians can just squeeze in from one side and the Russians just squeeze in from the other, and all of a sudden the United States is out of the picture. That's not the way that we need to go. That's why it's important, um, in my opinion, and the opinion of many others, that the United States become a participant to the Law of the Sea Treaty so that we can be at the table to, to advance our claim for those, those offshore, those outer continental shelf areas off of the coast of Alaska so that we can lay claim to those resources. We can be a participant at the table of the Arctic. Well, I would like to suggest that we have the support in the Senate in terms of the two-thirds necessary to, to ratify and accept that treaty. Unfortunately, as you know, in the Senate, all it takes is, is one to, to uh, kind of put the kibosh on something, uh, an initiative moving forward. Uh, our problem at this juncture is we're running out of a, out of a calendar, uh, a legislative calendar, and so the likelihood of it passing in, in the 110th Congress is, is very slim. We have been active in working with the administration and, and many others to make sure that people understand um, the, the importance of passage uh, or ratification of the Law of the Sea Treaty, that they understand that in view of the, some of the resource issues, some of the security issues up north, uh, that perhaps there's greater urgency or greater relevance now to the Law of the Sea Treaty. I would like to think that our activities in the Arctic would be, um, would be activities that come about because of cooperation and collaboration. It is, the Arctic has been described as, as kind of the peace zone, if you will. I would like to think that we can demonstrate through through an air of, of cooperation and collaboration and, and truly working together um, in the Arctic that, that we don't have um, confrontational um, aspects in the, in the North. Um, some may say that that's wishful thinking, but I think there is a recognition uh, of those Arctic nations that, for instance, from an environmental perspective, if something happens up there in, in the, the high north, um, an environmental accident that happens in Russia is not necessarily going to be contained over there in, in, in the ice off Russia. It has the potential to impact all of us. We all have a stake in ensuring that there is safety and soundness and reliability. Uh, so I, I, think, I think we have an opportunity to demonstrate to the rest of the world how we truly can, as Arctic nations, be working together rather than to, to approach this from, uh, from a controversial perspective. And the research has been very helpful. This is, the, this is the international polar year, and the collaboration that we're seeing uh, on, on, in, in, in the Arctic on all aspects of research has been really very encouraging. Uh, we just concluded the Arctic Parliamentarians Conference that we hosted in Fairbanks, Alaska, the first time the United States has ever hosted an Arctic Parliamentarian Conference. And to see that degree of of, of cooperation, I think, is very hopeful for the future of the North.